Welcome everyone uh, to our Capital Markets Day 2023. It's great to see so many of you in person and welcome to those of you joining online as well. Today, we announce how we will deliver more value with less emissions. We do that on the back of a differentiated strategy for a balanced energy transition. This is underpinned by a commitment to our world-leading integrated gas and upstream businesses, and by leveraging adjacencies and strengths in our differentiated downstream businesses to develop profitable low-carbon opportunities that enable the energy transition. We target a 10% per annum free cash flow per share growth through to 2025 with a ruthless focus on performance, discipline, and simplification, enabled by a structural cost reduction of two to $3 billion by the end of 2025, and a lowering of our capital spend to 22 to $25 billion per annum over 2024 and 2025. This allows us to enhance our shareholder distributions to the 30 to 40% of CFFO level. Our confidence in a sustainable increase to our free cash flow also leads us today to announce a dividend per share increase of 15% at Q2, subject to board approval, and a minimum buyback program of $5 billion for the second half of the year, as we preferentially aim to allocate capital to share buybacks. In short, today we will outline our plan to become the investment case through the energy transition. But before we dive into all of that, let me start off by introducing my management team. First, Sinead. Known to many of you, Sinead has been with Shell for 24 years. She has excelled in roles across the company from upstream to projects and technology and from integrated gas to trading. Next is Zoe Unovich. Zoe had had a very successful career outside of Shell and since joining, she has continued her excellent track record of delivery across upstream and integrated gas while bringing an external perspective to our executive committee. Finally, we have Hybrid Vigaveno, who has had a distinguished career at Shell in numerous roles across the world. Hybrid is a specialist in downstream, and I don't know anyone with more knowledge of our customers. Together, we have a lot of ground to cover, touching on what will stay the same and what will change. But let me start with what isn't changing, our strategy. Powering progress sets out our strategy to create value, first and foremost for our shareholders, as well as for our customers and wider society. We do this by focusing on generating sustained shareholder value, reducing carbon emissions, powering lives, and respecting nature. Our purpose remains the same and continues to be as relevant today as it was in 2021, to provide more and cleaner energy solutions. We will profitably transition Shell to become a net zero emissions energy business by 2050. Powering progress has withstood significant external volatility and discontinuities and shown it continues to be the right strategy. The last three years have not only been a huge challenge for the world, they have significantly challenged the energy system. As a consequence of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, governments grappled with the importance of energy security. A mere 1% reduction in global energy supply had significant consequences for trade flows and commodity price volatility. Despite these challenges, the company performed well, and its response only strengthened our convictions and our fundamental beliefs. And we have not been standing still, as you will have seen in our latest energy transition progress report. We will provide an update on our energy transition strategy in early 2024. Let's now take a look at the energy system. Now, how the energy system will look in five, 10, or 20 years from now is impossible to say. But in the midst of this uncertainty, there will be developments we can be fairly sure of. The global energy mix is changing. However, demand for energy services will continue to grow and will have to be met by a combination of different types of energy. There is no one solution. It is critical that the world avoids dismantling the current energy system faster than we are able to build the clean energy system of the future. Oil and gas will continue to play a crucial role in the energy system for a long time to come, with demand reducing only gradually over time. Continued investment in oil and gas is critical to ensure a balanced energy transition because of the growing energy demand I just mentioned, as well as the natural decline rates 
and severe underinvestment in recent years. We also believe that liquefied natural gas, or LNG, will play an even bigger role in the energy system of the future than it plays today. The reasons are clear. LNG can be easily transported to places where it is needed most. And what's more, on average, natural gas emits about 50% less carbon emissions than coal when used to produce electricity, making it the natural lower carbon substitute in the near term. The pace of the transition from fossil fuels to low carbon energy depends on many things, including government policy and regulations, the affordability of energy, development of new technologies, and importantly, changing customer demand. Low carbon energy is expected to represent a growing proportion of worldwide energy demand in the future in the form of both molecules and electrons. I believe Shell has the customer access and the relationships that will allow us to thrive in this context. Which brings me to the next slide. There are only a few energy companies that can successfully build new business models in more complex and hard to abate sectors, such as transport and industry. We are amongst the leading global players today in both sectors, satisfying more than 3% of energy demand. These sectors matter. They currently make up around 70% of total energy demand, representing more than 55% of emissions, and the combined addressable market is expected to conservatively double to around 10 to $12 trillion by 2050. They are both sectors where we have incumbency, system understanding, and control points, and will therefore be our focus areas. We will address our customers' needs with a focus on molecules, given our natural strengths in that area. We will selectively invest in renewable generation, and mostly supplement with electrons from others. We recognize our distinct advantages are less in generation and much more in trading and optimization, in B2B customer intimacy, and eventually in low carbon molecules, which are enabled by green electrons. In short, we want to play to our strengths, where we can uniquely add value. While the destination of a net zero emissions energy system remains clear, this will not be a linear journey, as different places transition at different paces. Let's be honest, no one knows the exact pace at which this will evolve in every country, and therefore we will be pragmatic in our approach. We will also be dynamic in our response. We are absolutely committed to our world-class upstream and integrated gas businesses, which will increasingly have lower emissions and through which we will continue to provide secure energy. We will profitably enable the energy transition by leaning into low carbon opportunities, not everywhere, but where we have adjacencies, a track record, and where we see the right environment to invest. We will focus, as the market evolves, on low carbon molecules serving the transport and industry sectors. And we will do this with a relentless focus on performance, discipline, and simplification across the organization. This will allow us to reward our shareholders today and well into the future. With the portfolio we have and the direction we have set out, I firmly believe that Shell, in addition to being recognized as a great company, will be the investment case through the energy transition. So how do we accomplish that? I've previously talked about operationalizing powering progress. That means focusing on delivery during the here and now. Having the right strategy is critical, but is not enough to ensure that we deliver to our full potential. We have to take our strategy and translate it into everyday actions, and those actions need to be guided by certain principles if we are to be successful. Those principles are performance, discipline, and simplification. With these principles in mind, we embark on our first sprint. We use the concept of a sprint through to 2025 to establish a track record under this management team with a focus on delivering the targets we have promised over this period while investing to take advantage of opportunities for our future. Getting the most out of the great assets we have means delivering on a consistent basis, quarter after quarter, year after year. Take deep water. In the first quarter, we saw the highest controllable availability in a decade at our Gulf of Mexico assets, and the business has been performing close to its potential for a prolonged period. This is what performance looks like, delivering world-class results day in and day out. But results are not just absolute. 
It is our commitment to ensure that we make the most out of our portfolio on a relative basis versus our peers. And this is what I want to drive across the company. We are embedding accountability for delivery through the business lines and deeper into the organization. To deliver excellent performance, you need a company that is focused on creating value and that diligently delivers what it promises. That takes discipline. Discipline in how we invest and allocate capital. Discipline in how we spend. And discipline in how we execute. Every dollar of our shareholders' money needs to be stewarded with care. You will hear, me, you'll hear more about that from Sinead shortly. We have not always been known for our speed and simplicity. That is changing. You will have seen that we began the year by streamlining our executive committee to enable faster and more nimble decision making. Shortly after, we took the decision not to proceed with the biofuels unit and base oils plant investments at our Singapore Energy and Chemicals Park. Last week, we announced the divestment of the European Shell Energy retail business, and today we are announcing not only the plan to market our interest in Shell Pakistan, but also the strategic review of the Singapore Energy and Chemicals Park. This is more than just disciplined capital allocation. This is about decisively simplifying and high grading our portfolio. And it's not just the organization and portfolio that we are looking to simplify. We are also moving from over 40 business and financial commitments to four very focused group level financial targets that you will see later in the slide pack. So we are making choices, questioning projects and assets with one goal in mind. Every single part of our business needs to help us deliver more shareholder value while lowering emissions. Having just covered the how, let's now discuss the what. We are blessed with an incredibly well-positioned portfolio, which we must get the most out of and develop further. You will hear more about the specifics of each of the businesses from Zoe and Hybert shortly. However, let me give you a sense of what we will be focusing on. We have a leading integrated gas business, which we intend to grow while addressing the key challenges that we have experienced in our operations. We see considerable potential to create further value here with new production coming on stream and having signed a number of attractive third party contracts for LNG. Earlier, I outlined our conviction that oil and gas will be required for the foreseeable future. And it is our advantaged upstream portfolio along with integrated gas that will contribute to enabling us to deliver the secure energy that the world needs today and for a long time to come. We will continue to do so with a focus on value over volume and an expectation that liquids production will remain stable through to 2030, having met our high grading target in 2022. Onto our differentiated downstream renewables and energy solutions business, which is our primary customer facing vehicle. First, we will focus on value over volume in our marketing business by reducing our mobility footprint and getting the most out of the portfolio. We will also high grade our chemicals and products business, improve delivery from our energy and chemicals parks while repurposing them to provide the cleaner molecules that our customers demand. We will achieve all of this by leveraging our world class trading and optimization capabilities, which have served us well and which we expect will deliver some two to 4% of Rawachi uplift, depending on market conditions. Simply put, all of this gives us the confidence to announce enhanced distributions of 30 to 40% of CFFO through the cycle, which will be underpinned by a greater than 10% per annum free cash flow per share growth through to 2025. And we will invest 10 to $15 billion between 2023 and 2025 in low carbon energy solutions, positioning us to capture the significant value opportunities we expect will emerge through the energy transition in our focus markets. In short, we will deliver more value with less emissions. With that, it's time for me to hand over to Sinead to talk us through how we are going to achieve this. Thank you, Weil. We take our responsibility as custodians of our shareholders' capital extremely seriously. At the heart of everything that we do will be a ruthless approach to capital allocation and a singular focus on creating long-term value. We will make every dollar count, be unemotional with our spend, and deliver performance, not promises. And so, this is not just about distributions, but also about how we drive discipline across the entire organization. 
enabling us to reduce both OPEX and CAPEX. Despite inflationary pressures and a volatile external context, today we are lowering our cash capex range from $23 to $27 billion to $22 to $25 billion for both 2024 and 2025. I will say more on this lately, shortly, but first let me outline our plans for cost. We aim to achieve $2 to $3 billion of structural cost reductions by the end of 2025. This is about streamlining the way we work simplifying our processes and being laser focused. We will seek to achieve structural savings across all parts of Shell. This will require focusing the portfolio by exiting high cost and lower return businesses and simplifying the remaining core. To give you a sense of how focusing the company can contribute, the exit from Shell Energy Retail alone will remove some $300 million per annum of operating expenses, both directly and in terms of overheads and management's time. And in terms of our approach to businesses that remain, during my time in Upstream, over a period of three years, we reduced costs by some 10% in our lean assets with our conventional oil and gas portfolio. We achieved this through simplifying the operating model, removing layers, increasing accountabilities, and taking a risk-based approach to all activities. We intend to replicate this across the company and expect significant savings. Focusing the company isn't just about the portfolio. It extends to the sectors we serve, as Weil said earlier. We will prioritize hard to abate sectors, namely transport and industry, to help grow and decarbonize our customer base. This will lead to opportunities to further simplify and take cost out. We will identify and go after opportunities quarter after quarter, year after year. All of this will enable us to enhance shareholder distributions. We remain confident in the performance of the business which is why today we are announcing our plan to increase the dividend per share by an expected 15% at Q2, subject to board approval. We continue to believe that we are undervalued, and as a result, we will preferentially allocate capital to share buybacks. That is why we are announcing buybacks for the second half of this year of a minimum of $5 billion to be completed by the Q4 results announcement, subject to board approval. In short, being more disciplined in cost and capital generates more cash to support a growing dividend and continuing with buybacks. Now let me cover CapEx. In the recent past, our spend has been at the higher end of our peer group, and we believe that constraining capital will force us to make tougher just choices, ensuring that only the most attractive projects will receive funding. This will reinforce our focus on delivery across the company during the first sprint through to the end of 2025. As stated earlier, we will be lowering our cash capex range to 22 to $25 billion for both 2024 and 2025. We expect to spend some $13 billion per annum in integrated gas and upstream going forward, with both continuing to contribute significantly to cash flows for the foreseeable future allowing us to sustain our liquids production and grow LNG sales. Having made a number of organic and inorganic investments in marketing such as Nature Energy in Denmark and of course Landmark in the US, we will now reduce capital expenditure in the short term and focus on getting the most out of the investments we have already made. In chemicals and products, we will largely focus on spend that sustains our current business with an expectation that capital employed will be flat in 2030 versus today. And finally, in renewables and energy solutions, we will take a measured approach. We will selectively take development risk in renewable generation projects, diluting as they mature and retaining access to the green electrons. In hydrogen and CCS, we will invest to decarbonize our own assets first and help to decarbonize our customers over time. Our annual cash capex after power dilutions will be some 21 to 23 billion for both 2024 and 2025 capital and carbon will be managed centrally. We will allocate carbon in a similar way to how we allocate capital, pragmatic in our approach and dynamic in our response. We expect to grow free cash flow on an absolute basis by a rate of more than 6% through to 2030. This is compared to a normalized 2022, which was an exceptional year, and is based on a $65 per barrel real term oil price. Now let's cover how are we going to allocate the cash that we deliver beyond CapEx. The cash generating ability of the business and the actions we are taking allows us to both continue to pay our dividend and allocate capital to buybacks 
in line with our new 30 to 40% of CFFO guidance in both a $50 and a $65 per barrel world. The additional cash flows in a $65 world would go to a mix of both buybacks and deleveraging. We continue to believe share pre uh, pre repurchases are a good use of our cash, and hence you will see us allocate capital towards buybacks even at $50 per barrel. Continued share account reduction and growing free cash flow means that we expect an annual free cash flow per share growth rate of greater than 10% through 2025. The dividend remains our number one financial priority and our confidence in our ability to sustain the increase that we have announced today together with a progressive approach is well supported given that our dividend break even stands at some $40 per barrel. Everything that I've covered so far feeds into our financial framework. It is clear that we believe in pragmatism and balance. This means allocating capital based on value. We place importance on the strength of our balance sheet and our ambition to have AA credit metrics through the cycle remains. We will continue to look for opportunities to reduce net debt while staying true to our preference for share buybacks. The improvements that we are making will continue to be allocated to shareholders. We will reduce OPEX, reduce CAPEX, instill more discipline, and increase our distributions. Simply put, more for our money, meaning more for our shareholders. Thank you, and now back to Weil. Thank you, Sinead. As we delivered the oil and gas the world needs today, we reduced carbon emissions from our operations by 30% by the end of 2022, as compared with 2016 on a net basis. This is more than halfway towards our target of a 50% reduction by 2030. We achieved this while globally energy-related emissions increased by around 4% over the same period. We continue to bring down emissions at pace and have made excellent progress. And we are going further. As an industry, it is imperative that we do our utmost to reduce and ultimately eliminate methane emissions. At Shell, we will aim to achieve near zero methane emissions by 2030. In the shorter term, we aim to eliminate routine flaring from our upstream operations by 2025, challenging ourselves to move faster than the World Bank's zero routine flaring 2030 initiative. As we transition this company, we will approach both capital and carbon allocation with the same discipline and value focus. What this means in terms of carbon is that we will preferentially allocate our budget to businesses such as integrated gas in which we have a strategic advantage and that lower the overall carbon footprint of the energy system. Furthermore, we will invest in carbon abatement projects in these businesses to minimize their impact. As a consequence, this will require us to achieve reductions disproportionately from parts of the company that we are less advantaged in, such as chemicals and products. The world needs companies like Shell to reduce carbon in the energy system while exercising pragmatism. For example, we will work together with our customers to displace high carbon energy sources such as coal with cleaner alternatives such as gas. Beyond working to cut carbon emissions from our own operations, we are committed to supporting our customers in their decarbonization journey. For this to happen, we need a fundamental change in demand, along with the supply, from fossil fuels to low carbon energy solutions. This will need to be supported by regulations, as well as the development of new technologies. We at Shell will play our part. We plan to invest some 10 to $15 billion across 2023 to 2025 to support the development of low carbon energy solutions, including biofuels, hydrogen, electric vehicles charging, and carbon capture and storage. Take Holland Hydrogen One. We will produce hydrogen from renewable power to cut emissions from our operations and help decarbonize our customers. In short, we will develop enabling infrastructure in areas where we see adjacencies with our integrated businesses and pathways to attractive returns in the medium term, while we also see longer term opportunities. We are leveraging our strengths in hard to abate sectors such as transport and industry, supplying products and services that we believe will be commercially viable and truly move the needle. 
These sectors and others will need bold government policies and regulations that stimulate the demand for low carbon energy, which in turn allow businesses like ours to continue to invest. We will continue to transparently advocate in favor of these enabling policies. We will also embrace innovation in support of the transition. At our technology hubs, we take ideas from concept to customer, enabling them to transition faster. In 2022, 40% of our total R&D spend went to proving and scaling low carbon products and services. That nicely leads me to two critical enablers I believe we have to deliver more value with less emissions. Technology and people are the backbone of our success today and will be critical for our success in the future. Our technology hubs are providing innovations, leveraging capabilities such as high-performance cloud computing and digital solutions in our oil and gas business, doubling the speed of seismic data processing. And artificial intelligence has allowed us to increase LNG production by 1% to 2% with no extra capital spend. In other words, adding significant and tangible value today. And we are also developing the technologies for our lower carbon future, such as our CanSolve technology to capture CO2, which won eight consecutive bids we competed for in 2022. But the heart of Shell is in our 93,000 strong people. Our employee survey results last year reflected some of the highest scores we have seen in a decade confirming our people are as engaged as ever and that we have a great workplace culture. And we work hard on improving this further. For example, through our drive to become one of the most diverse and inclusive companies in the world, today 30% of our senior leaders are women. This management team's opportunity is to fully mobilize the tremendous energy amongst our people to deliver the targets and ambitions that we have set for ourselves. So let me summarize what I hope you will take away today. We will provide the secure energy that the world needs by investing around $40 billion in our integrated gas and upstream businesses, while investing 10 to $15 billion in low carbon energy solutions between 2023 and 2025, positioning us for the transition. Performance, discipline, and simplification will be our guiding principles. The additional free cash flow that we will deliver will accrue to our shareholders, resulting in distributions of 30 to 40% of CFFO. We continue to believe our shares represent significant value, and so we will preferentially allocate capital to buybacks. For this reason, in addition to increasing the dividend per share by 15%, we are also announcing buybacks for the second half of the year of a minimum of $5 billion. All of this means we will deliver a free cash flow per share growth of greater than 10% through to, through to 2025. In short, we aim to be the investment case through the transition. With that, I thank you for your attendance, both in person and online, and now Sinead and I will take your questions. Sinead. Um, we're going to go via tables, and, and remember, we will later have a session with Zoe and with Hubert. So I think focus a bit your questions on what you've heard so far. This is always nice to to try with you guys, but I'm still trying. So um, let's see where we go. Go here first with Oswald. Then go around. Get the mic. Sorry, one question or two? Two. You're allowed two. Everyone is allowed two. But short ones. Short ones. Th th thank you very much. Um, Oswald Clinton Bernstein. Uh, the first question, really on the first sprint and, and trying to get you know, all of this performance, discipline, simpli the simplifying through the 93,000 people. I mean, you know, BP, for example, just to name your peer, has given everyone equity in BP for the first time to have skin in the game and, ex and actually deliver the numbers. So I'd love to get a bit of sense of the methods to distill this philosophy well down through the organization just to make sure all of these numbers to 2025 are actually delivered. And then the second question, it's great to see the capex coming down. Uh, Sinead, you mentioned despite inflation, you can able to do that. So, uh, you know, rig rates, you're talking about upstream longevity, cash flow longevity, rig rates are getting back up to $500,000 a day. So how is this going to be possible through this period? Thank you. 
All right, great, thanks, Oswald. I'll take the first one, and then Sinead, if you want to take the second one. Um, Oswald, indeed, that concept of the first sprint is all about a cultural sprint, right? It's what we're trying to do is to be able to embed a culture through the organization that is going to be able to withstand the test of time. We have a great set of values as a company, but what we haven't done consistently is deliver our promises. And so how do we do that day in and day out? Firstly, I touched on how we're going to drive accountability through the business lines deeper into the organization. That's everything from how we work manuals of authority to expectations at various leadership levels. How we're going to be very clear on the outcomes that we are seeking from the businesses and how the functions will support those business outcomes day in and day out. It's going to be a step up in the performance, uh, performance cadences that we have. For example, Sinead and I will meet with our, with our business directors on a very regular basis now, uh, once, every, uh, once every couple of weeks, where we can get into the detail and expedite the decision making and really get the interventions that are needed earlier. And we will look to cascade down uh, that entire sort of philosophy deeper into the organization. So a lot more of that, how we set up that ecosystem, will play through over the coming months. Sinead? No, thanks, Oswald. And indeed, as you say, we're, we're moving from a 23 to 27 billion range to a 22 to 25 billion. So there's a couple of things in there. Look at where are we taking it from as well. So what you see us doing is, in effect, moving in two ways. Slightly or partly from our um, chemicals and products business, which is much more capital intensive. So we're taking some away from there <clears throat> where we would have been looking to sustain that business, as we talked about earlier and also some from our marketing business as well. We still have a lot of growth in our marketing business, but why we're taking a couple of billion away from there is simply put, because this year, in 2023, it is a huge um, year for actually investment externally. So we talked about Nature Air and Energy earlier, which is some two billion, and of course, Volta as well. So we've already done a lot of the investments, actually green investments this year around it. Where the money is going to is actually a little bit of an uplift in terms of our um, uh, upstream and integrated gas business. Now, you rightly say, you know, well, rigs are going up. What's happening there? This is a part of the business where actually we've contracted longer term. We've already got advantage positions in our rigs, positioning out, and you'll hear Zoe talk about that later as well, including around Namibia. So we're very confident and have great conviction that we can deliver within this despite the inflation. So very comfortable. Thanks, Shanit. Okay, we'll go for the next question. Uh, remind to introduce yourself and then um, one or two questions. Lucas, we get the phone, the microphone. You have it? Okay. And Lucas is here. Thanks, thanks very much, Jack, and uh, in line with your request, Lucas Herman at uh, BNP Paribas XN. I think two directed at, at you probably, Sinead. I mean, the first is um, trying to understand balance sheet debt, what AA actually means. I'm not a credit analyst, yep. but if you could give me some indication of what level of debt you feel that means you'd be happy living with or where you can go down to, that would be helpful. Um, you tend to disadvantage yourself, I think, when you present debt, because you include operating leases, which the majority, well, all of your peers don't. And the second question was just to better understand the capex numbers that you put forward and the net off from um, divestment, well, from selling down part of uh, the power business. So when I think about, more, how do I think about capex in terms of uh, inclusion of organic, inorganic divestment, and you've made no comment on proceeds from divestment outside power, if you could expand on that. Sorry, it's a bit long-winded. No, no, not at all, good questions. Thanks, Lucas. So in terms of the AA, um, so we haven't really talked about debt, as you say, particularly here, and, and that's largely because of, you know, we've taken tens of billions down our debt um, uh, profile in terms of the last couple of years. So if you remember, we're sitting at some 44 billion, you know, at year end in terms of debt. What I've said before, and I stand behind now as well, is that I'm quite comfortable with the level of debt we're at at the moment. We will continue to bring it down from time to time, but I will preferentially allocate capital in terms of value, which is why you see the preferential allocation to the buyback specifically. So you'll see the debt move. You may see it go up as well. If there's volatility and I have room to make more money, you'll see it come back up as well. The AA is really a... Um, it gives you the concept of I'm comfortable in terms of holding my debt around this level to be able to sustain the company in all scenarios. And that's really what it's about more than anything else. I hear your comment in terms of operating leases, et cetera. We do, we present it very clean. I won't comment on our peers there. Don't have any hybrids, et cetera, in there as well. But it is, uh, it is our way of presenting it. In terms of CapEx, you draw out the fact that, um, particularly on power, that it's net of dilutions. Look, just really simply put, we've, we've talked before about the fact that, and, and Wells mentioned it, 
that we want to use electrons to enable our business going forward. But what we also know is that we want to be able to make sure that that is within certain boundaries. So what we are doing here is simply saying is that we will spend money, but it will be dependent on our ability to also dilute. So what you see is the dilutions coming down of, of two billion um, in there, one to two. We'll see how that plays out. We don't talk about other divestments because we will divest our business as we move forward. This is specifically around about the discipline that we will have around power in particular, and that's why we signal it or bring it out as well. In terms of your final point with the third bit of your question, which was organic versus inorganic, very shortly includes inorganic in there as well. You see us do the bolt-ons that we've done. So you see us over the sprint period do nature energy, Volta, et cetera. That is absorbed within our numbers. With no large inorganics planned for the first sprint. Exactly. Thank you. Go here. Danielle. Hi, uh, Sam Margolin from Wolf Research. Uh, two questions on low carbon. Um, First one, sort of a follow-up on organic versus inorganic. You have a pipeline of projects that you could do for low-carbon molecules, but margins are very high in that category today, and there's some uncertainty about where they'll be in the future, so there's sort of an impulse to acquire operating assets. So um, the question would just be, how do you square sort of the outlook for uh, low-carbon molecule saturation and supply and demand versus a near-term impulse to, to maybe beef up your asset base today? And then secondly, uh, you had a, a peer of yours did an event here last year and actually increased their capex in power. And the reason was that they just asserted that power prices would be structurally higher uh, forever. And so I'm wondering where you stand on that topic and whether that informs any of your capital allocation. Thank you. Yeah. Let me take the first one if you want to take the second sure. one there, Sinead. I think on the, on the low carbon molecular base, I mean, our view is that low carbon fuels, in particular biofuels and biogas, will indeed continue to have a prominent role over the coming years, enabled particularly by regulatory support. Without that, it becomes more tenuous. We are already one of the largest players in that space. So last year, for example, we sold 14 times what we actually produced. We have a very strong trading network, and later what you'll hear is some of the numbers where it's a business that is already value accretive. I mean, we generated $300 million just last year from that business or over the last couple of years. And so what you will see is this is a business we will want to continue to grow. I'm going to leave hybrid to talk a bit more to the business. But the critical thing I would leave you with is we already have many of the assets that we want organically. So having uh, Hyazen, which is really going after first and second generation and more and more second generation uh, biofuels. Of course, we've just completed Nature Energy. That gives us a a world-class platform, the leading platform in Europe for biogas, and we're investing in a large facility in Rotterdam there as well. So we have the big hubs that we need, and now it's about leveraging those hubs to unlock value from our customer base and our trading organization. Yeah, and thanks, Sam. On the second one, so rather than commenting on what our peers have done, what I would say is the underlying thinking is always around value over volume. So we allocate our capital with discipline, but it'll be under the lens of value. So if you were to see low carbon fuels you know, ramp up in an amazing way, you would see us change our, our allocation according to that. So we are quite pragmatic in our approach, dynamic in our response, and you'll see that play out throughout. So in terms of our, our, power, our power side of things, I think it's very dangerous for anyone to comment on power prices across the globe. As we all know, it's very, very regional. And you'll hear hybrid talk later on actually very much around where we will play in power. So rather than taking an approach across the globe, you'll see us focus into certain areas, whether that's the US, Australia, and I'll leave it to him to, to talk that through a bit more. But that's really where the thinking is. If things change, could we ramp up? Absolutely we could. It'll, it'll depend on the return and the value we can generate from that. Good. Let's keep going. Yeah. Right there. Uh, thank you. Paul Chan, Scotia Bank. Uh, two questions, please. Uh, first one, I think, uh, is going back into your course uh, restructuring, uh, two to three billion dollar. Uh, wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more in terms of whether the, any divestment of business is included in that number. And if you can put it maybe in different category, what percentage will be coming from personnel related and what percentage from other structural benefit. 
And second one, I think, is for Wei. Uh, you're talking about faster decision and capital discipline. So how that your FID projects criteria and process have changed subsequently? I mean, is there any major change, or you're just saying, putting, asking people that to, A, taking more conservative assumptions? I mean, how exactly that we should feel confident that, yes, indeed, it's going to lead to better and faster result? Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Do you want to take the yeah, first question? Sure, happy to start. So we give two, three billion, um, Paul, as well, just in terms of trying to give a view for, for what you would expect to see happen. And that's structural, you're correct. I give the example in, my, um, in the speech, actually, about the fact that that will include some divestments in there. So we talked about Searle or Shell Energy Retail in Europe as well. So that will include um, those as well. The reason I'm not more specific on the splits between them is because, really simply put, whether it's capital or whether it's OPEX, we'll allocate it according to what makes sense at the time. So actually, a lot of the businesses that Hybrid runs Actually, in terms of OPEX, we can get you know, a good um, use of that OPEX as well. So you'll see that play out. So over the next three years, we will take out two to three billion. Some of it will be through divestments. Some of it will be through actually just changing the way we operate and where we put that OPEX at the same time. But I don't have a good split for you in the sense of, because actually I don't want to have a good split for it. I want to be able to move the money to where I see the value at that point in time. Thanks, Sinead. And then Paul, the question around decision-making. Look, this is not just about um, FIDs. This is much more holistic. So when we talk about performance, discipline, simplification, there's decision-making across it all. In performance, I mentioned earlier to the question that Oswald asked, the focus on getting to a much faster cadence and really being clear on what are all the levers to be able to achieve outcomes and how we think about downside mitigation. Right? Really being clear, how do we make sure we deliver what we promise? When it comes to discipline, just choosing. Because if you leave 20 different projects open, you're paying a lot of money to keep all those options open. We're just going to be more disciplined in what are the highest likelihood projects that are going to move forward. And those are decisions that will need to be made by the business directors as they manage the pool of OPEX and capital that they have. And then there's simplification. We have multiple sectors that we are serving today. That's why we talk about focusing on transport and industry so that we can be very decisive around where are we going to actually lean forward rather than try to uh, dilute our efforts. Similarly, when we talk about low carbon molecular focus, we know that's where our strength. There's no company in the world, in our view, that can win in the molecular space going forward. We're winning in that space in today's conventional energy, and in future, we have the opportunities to do the same with green molecules. And so we want to focus on the areas where we know we can differentiate ourselves and we, we know we can win. Okay, we go there. Christian? Hi, good morning, and uh, congratulations on this presentation. Um, two questions, please. Christian Malley from JP Morgan. Uh, first of all, uh, what happens after 2025? Um, you, you talk about a time frame around CapEx and uh, savings, which is, which is admirable given you have a line of sight to 2025. But the reason I ask that question is, it's clear there's a huge range of outcomes beyond that. You know, EIA, so IA today talking about demand peaking in this decade, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you think about your capex um, and your investments beyond 2025? Should we expect an increase? And within that, um, and this is still the first question, your all price outlook. I mean, 65 is a safe place to be. At some point, you have to make a decision, arguably, whether you think it's going to be higher or lower in the context of those investments. So I just want to understand the relationship between all price, capex, beyond 2025, and why haven't you provided the outlook in this, um, in this CMD? Um, and then the second question uh, pertains to your uh, cash return outlook and your dividend. We're here in New York, you're presenting, um, and when I think about where you sit versus your peer group on cash and cash return, um, how do you justify the 15% increase in dividend in the context of your absolute cash return to shareholders relative to the US peers? If you're trying to generate a high value on the stock, surely the first thing you do is be comparable with absolute cash return. So where is that quantum and how do you think about raising it in the future? Thank you. Super, thanks, Christian. I'll take the first one and I'll ask Sinead if you take the second one. Um, what happens after 2025? What I want to emphasize is we have provided guidance of 6% uh, per annum free cash flow growth all the way to 2030. So we see a very robust pathway to be able to achieve that, and that's greater than 6%. At the same time, the whole concept of the sprint 
uh, is multifold. One I talked about earlier, which is to be able to demonstrate the credentials and the delivery of this management team. But as importantly, I would be lying to you if I pretended to know where various markets that we're looking at are going to go in the 2026, 2027, 2028 period. We're seeing right now, for example, in something like power, take power as an example. Offshore wind has been significantly uh, beaten up over the last uh, few months, and uh, solar is doing a bit better. We're seeing green shoots in, in biofuels. We're getting excited about EV charging. I want to be able to make sure we have the flexibility to, to allocate shareholder capital in a responsible way. So what happens after 2025? It's, it's, we're not at the point in time right now where we want to provide capital guidance. What we want to give you a sense of is the growth trajectory of our free cash flow, that's 6%. And hopefully, once we've earned that right to be able to continue to steward your capital in the most effective way as, as shareholders, we will be able to then, in 2024, 2025, give you the next phase of the sprint as we look at where we want to go through to 2030. Uh, so I think most important right now is the performance, discipline, simplification, embed that culture, and then we look forward. Shalit. Yeah, indeed, and thanks, Well, Actually, it, it's a great base to build on for the response. I mean, Christian, what we are looking at, of course, is, is about the sprint. It's about providing the information for now. So what are we looking at? 30 to 40 percent. We've increased it from 20 to 30 to 30 to 40. What you know and see from our actions is that we've always been very pragmatic about it. We look, where are we in the quarter at the time? We look at what is the environment we're in? So in, in the past, you've seen us move up and down on that, and you will see exactly the same in this case. So it's 30 to 40 percent through the cycle. That's what we're giving you. In terms of that, in terms of the 15% of dividend, you know where I'm going to respond on this probably. You know in the sense of my view is, and I think as a management team, our view is that our stock is undervalued. Therefore, we're going very clearly towards allocating capital to where we can create value for shareholders very, very clearly, which is around the buybacks. So that's how it plays out in its entirety on this. Thank you. Okay, we go to Michele here, and we'll go back there. Michele De La Vigna from Goldman Sachs, thank you very much for the presentation and congratulations on resisting the industry trend towards higher capex. Um, I wanted to ask two questions. The first one on the cost cutting of two to three billion dollars per annum by 2025. For us to track it, will it be as simple as simply looking at the OPEX in 2025? There will be two to three billion lower or does it get to be more complex because the cost cutting is before inflation and other changes in the portfolio? And then my second question is for the long-term DPS increase outlook. Should we just think it in a simple way as saying the free cash flow per share will grow over 10%? So that could be a good indication of where we could see DPS growing in the coming years through underlying growth in the business and retirement of, of share accounts. Thanks, Michele. You want to take those two? Yeah, certainly. Indeed, Michele. Indeed, good spot. You see, we talk about very much the two to three billion on structural. So what, we're, what we want to do is make sure that we improve the underlying health of the business. So hence the structural coming out. Yes, inflation will, will hit us. Yes, there will be different things after that. So we will have to come back to you to show how we map that out. But we will take two to three billion out from the underlying business that's there and continue to focus on that. Your second point was around in terms of the free cash flow per share. Indeed, we're looking at that as the right metric because, as you say, underlying um, business improving, therefore the free cash flow there, and you can back into it indeed as to where we see. So you will see us continue to allocate preferentially towards buybacks, which is why we think that is the right metric that we had um, through that. We'll continue to do that. We've only given guidance, as you've seen, in terms of the buybacks for the next two quarters, and that's in effect because we're very, very conscious that a lot of what we're talking about will be delivered in 24 and 25, and we we'll want to give you some certainty now on what you can see so you get, get that in the shorter term. And just, I think, part of the question was also the DPS. Is it going to sort of trend towards the 10%? Uh, don't want Michele to walk away with a 10% growth in DPS going forward. You want to touch on that? No, indeed. So you see our dividend per share. Apologies. No, I definitely want to clarify on that. Indeed, we have the 4% um, progressive dividend will continue. That will be definitely maintained. And in terms of the dividend up, uh, increase, it's the 15% now as well. So we will use that all to increase in terms of the free cash flow per share. You'll see that play out in the 10% that we've given and through to 25. Thanks, Shane. Great. Go in there. Yeah, go to the right. Yeah. Sorry, Ian. Hey, good morning. Uh, Roger Reed, Wells Fargo. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. One specific question on the CapEx for the renewable side, the 10 to 15 billion. 
given that we're kind of looking at a two year period, what makes up the range? Like that's a pretty wide area of, I don't know, I call it uncertainty or, or wiggle room, relatively speaking. The other question I had was trying to kind of put all this together and thinking about what you're delivering as the message, most importantly, internally. Is it to get the Roachi up a couple percentage points as was highlighted? Is it to get OPEX down? Is it the 30 to 40% of cash flow from operations? Is what you're telling us, but what are you, what's the message internally <laughs> of, uh, and how are people thinking about being measured? Great, Roger. Do you want to take the first one? I'll take the second one. Uh, sure, indeed. So the, um, there's actually a breakdown in the slides that you'll find actually on, I, I think it's slide 43, which is quite a useful one in terms of the CapEx to look at. But in terms of the 10 to 15, um, not an intent to give wriggle room at all. It's just purely about the fact that what you will naturally see us do is to ensure that we allocate to value. So if you remember, in terms of the low carbon aspects this year, I mean, I think it's fair to say that Nature Energy is, you know, is already two billion of that already in there, and you see us do Volt, and you see us continue, and you'll see us actually in the back of the pack, say four to five billion is on renewables as well. So no intent to have wriggle room. It's just really to give you a bit of a feel for the fact that we all know that when we enter into something, the timing of it can be plus or minus a month. That's it. Thanks, and maybe just to correct Roger, you talked about it being two years, it's three years. So yeah. the 10 to 15 billion is over a three year period, which includes 2023. And that's how we, uh, that's how we framed it. Uh, on, on what are we using internally. So um, every single one of our businesses is at a different point in its evolution. So if I look at uh, an upstream business, um, there is a lot of sunk capital, and we are being very careful in how we deploy the new capital. And therefore, Rowachi will spend more time looking backwards at the capital we deployed rather than just making sure that we are delivering the right returns today. Whereas a marketing business, we are looking at Rowachi much more closely. And so we're looking business by business to make sure that we are pointing uh, to the right outcomes to be able to unlock the full potential of that individual business. And that's, again, part of this performance cadence I, I talked about earlier, getting really clear. What are we trying to achieve in the next two to three years? If I use the example of chemicals and products, some of the announcements we have made today around um, strategic review of Singapore, high grading of our European footprint, is very much looking at the returns of those businesses. Can we see a pathway towards double-digit returns? Very difficult, so we've had to take action. Whereas other businesses in the portfolio in chemicals and products, we can see that pathway. And so we're literally looking at it at a granular level, business by business. Right. Lydia? No, will be you. Ron with the mic. Thanks. I can speak loudly as well, but it's Lydia Rainforth from Barclays. And while Sinead, you've presented some actually quite compelling numbers around growth and the free cash flow per share and what you want to achieve. And yet, also, you talked about performance over promises as well. So I guess what I'm getting to is are these ambitious numbers that you've set, or are they ones that you think you can easily achieve And in terms of driving the organization? And then linked to that, what's actually the most, what's the biggest challenge for you at this point? Yeah, let me, I'll address those. So I think, um, are these ambitious? You know, so we have staked the credibility of this management team on making sure that we deliver these targets. So I think they are not, soft targets by any stretch of the imagination. We have very clear pathways to be able to achieve it. And most importantly, we are focusing on what are the levers in case things start to go against us for whatever reason. So, so this is not a hopeful set of targets. It's targets grounded in reality and what we believe are achievable outcomes. Um, I'm really excited by the fact we can mobilize an organization around these ultimately four big financial business targets. Because I do think it's challenging when you have 30, 40 different targets to be able to really align an organization around outcomes. And I think that will help us go forward, Lydia. Uh, what's, what's the biggest challenge? I think the biggest challenge is this is not a journey of sell a few assets, invest capital here or there. This is a fundamental culture journey. Um, we have so much to be proud of as an organization. And we are now at a point in time, at an inflection point, as we are taking that next step in our evolution. Taking 93,000 people through a journey can be both exciting and daunting, in particular the number of countries we cover, in particular given the businesses we cover. So to me that is you know, what I mentioned earlier. This management team's opportunity, I think, is to unlock that latent potential that sits in that 93,000 strong staff base, which I think if we can unlock it, um, I think the, uh, the trajectory of the company is an incredibly exciting one. OK. 
Okay, cool. Um, Chris. Yep, here's Chris. Yep. Thank you, Chris Coupland from Bank of America. Uh, two hopefully quick ones. Um, Sinead, on slide 15, can you be a bit more specific? You're showing a 50 nominal and a 70 nominal case. Um, and I'm sorry, my ruler doesn't work, work very well uh, on my uh, uh, screen. Um, your 5 billion buyback comment for the second half, how does that fit into sure. that buyback range you're showing on that slide, please? Yeah. Um, and then one for you while, um, again, forgive me if I've missed it, but I'm flipping through those slides. And um, can you maybe give us a reason why a number of the previous volumetric targets have disappeared, including, I think, a de-emphasis of uh, scope three targets? Um, but I'm also keen on hearing your view on what happened to hydrogen, CCS, volumetric targets, terawatt hours, et cetera. So your philosophy yeah. behind not Thanks, Chris. Thank you. You want to take the first one, Shannon? Sure. There's always a risk, isn't there? Somebody's going to get a ruler right on me <laughs> and do exactly this. No, Chris, you're right. So, indeed, it's, it's, so that slide, I hope, is actually what we're trying to do is to help people understand our thinking behind it and give us the scenarios um, for where we, we uh, work them through. Those are illustrative. It's not any specific year that I put in there. It is, it is to give you some form of um, scenario more than anything else. What you see on that is the intent, of course, is that from a um, dividend point of view, you see the, the uh, break-even down to 40, and you also see, of course, the buybacks even at 50. So what you see on those two is on the, um, the $50, the left-hand side, you see buybacks still occurring. It's some four in there. That's the number that we put in for there. And you see on the other side, in terms of the 65, you see some um, eight in there. So that gives you a bit of a feel for what it is. Now, of course, subject to board approval, and we will move between where we see value, but that gives you a feel specifically to that. And Chris, your second question around the philosophy. I've grown up in the upstream business, and I think the curse of what we have done in the earlier part of the century was focused so much on production, it drove the, right, it drove the wrong outcomes. Um, I bring that same philosophy into, into, uh, into Shell at the moment, which is I can have CCS targets of you know, X million tons by 2030, and we can have hydrogen targets left, right, and center. But that speaks nothing to the, vo to the value that comes as a result of that. And what I have seen, also in my time looking after integrated gas and renewables, is the organization wants to do the right thing to deliver the targets we are promising, even if sometimes the value pools are simply not there. So by giving the organization the space to be able to say, no, this is a value-based decision. If you can actually demonstrate value, we will allocate capital. Simplifying it, making it much clearer that we are a value-driven company, that is what we're trying to do. Does that mean that we don't talk any volumes? No. When we talk about a production target, for example, it's not a target. It's 1.4 million barrels is what we will discuss later is where we expect to be by 2030, plus or minus. Right? And if, if we end up at 1.3 or 1.5, so be it. But it has to be value driven. And scope three, you'll just hear more about it in the energy transition strategy, more because of the fact that that, can, that requires, I think, a real sort of dialogue on its own. And what we have said is we continue to be committed to the targets we already have, and we will update, if, if anything, by March of 2024.